Let's pray as we begin. Father, be with us. Help us to wrestle with these difficult uh, concepts and ideas and to learn from them the simple message from you that you are God and you forgive, but you have standards. Amen. So today we're continuing looking at our series to the letters uh, to the churches in Revelation. And actually, Revelation itself is a letter, so these are letters within letters. It's going to get very confusing if you're not careful. Um, but there is so much in today's passage that when I initially prepared for this, you were going to have a 60-minute sermon. The good news for you is I've cut it to about a third of that. But there is a lot here that I'm not going to be able to cover. But today we're thinking specifically about two letters. But before that, what did the envelope say to the stamp? Stick with me and we'll go places. What eight-letter word has one letter in it? Envelope. envelope, very good, okay. What do snakes write at the bottom of their letters? Love and hisses. What does an envelope say, envelope say when you lick it? Nothing, it just shuts up. Anyway, enough, enough, enough. What is the context for these letters today? Well, our journey starts through the early chapters of Revelation, and we're looking at the letters specifically to Thyatira and Sardis. And if you look at the map of the churches in Revelation that these letters are going to, we can start to see a pattern coming. The letter actually comes originally from Patmos here, the island of Patmos, opposite Ephesus. And from there, the letter has probably been carried to Smyrna. If you can see Smyrna. And then to Pergamon or Pergamos, then to Thyatira, then to Sardis. And you can see the pattern. This generally is a circular letter. It's going around the churches of Turkey or uh, Asia Minor or whatever it is at that point. And this letter contains individual letters for churches. That's chapters 1 to 3. And they would all hear what everybody else was hearing as well. It's not just one church gets one letter. They all get to hear everybody else's letter as well. And then there's an overarching letter, which is the rest of the chapters, chapter 4 onwards. So let's start today by thinking about Thyatira. The letter to Thyatira starts and addresses a church that has been split by false teaching. It is the longest of the letters in Revelation. And that's quite strange because Thyatira is not a city with any big history. It just happens to be on the main communication route, the postal route that goes from Rome. And this has resulted in making it a thriving centre of commerce and trade. And one of the big produces that they actually trade is purple cloth. Now you might remember back it appears in the book of Ro uh, Acts by name. The first European convert in Paul's missionary journey happens in Philippi. And the person is called Lydia. Where did Lydia come from? Thyatira. What was Lydia's, Lydia's job? She was a dealer in purple cloth. So you can see that there is a link here. And it seems very likely to me that Lydia was probably the connection that led to the foundation of the church in Thyatira, this new city. Well, another thing we know about Thyatira is that it was a, a city where there were many different trade guilds. And I guess in modern days you might uh, label them like the Stonemasons Guild, or the Rail Workers Union, or the Steel Workers Union, or the Mothers Union, or whatever. You know, you get the idea. Actually, you know, I found out yesterday that you can still get uh, a city and guilds qualification in leather horse saddles here in Warsaw. Warsaw is a city or a town, a city probably bigger than them, a town bigger than there, with many different trades in the past. Anyway, that is quite important. And it's important to know about the different trade skills because one big aspect of the Thyatiran trade guilds were the important meals that they had together and the frequent celebrations. Each of the guilds would regularly celebrate and have parties and have big meetings together over food. And these were meals that would often begin and end with a formal sacrifice to the gods. 
and the meat that was eaten at the meal would have been sacrificed to the same idols. Now this was always an issue for the early church. You can read about it in the book of Acts. And apparently the communal meals and these celebrations were often places where wine flowed quite a lot and were renowned for debauchery and drunken revelry. Not unlike, I guess, an unhealthy Christmas work party. How could a Christian exist in this world? Well, clearly, the answer is they couldn't. They couldn't. It was simple. They needed to avoid these situations. You know, compromise is never good if it takes us away from the principles, the first, the vitally important things. And this meant that some of the Christians had to leave the trade guilds and the organizations of which they were part. And that meant that they lost their position because they refused to conform to the ways and the things that were unchristian. And for some of them, being a Christian at this time meant that you were no longer considered a citizen in the society in which you lived. There's also evidence of the Christians being removed from the city registers, a, a line through their name, being taken off the electoral roll, losing their rights. It meant they didn't have the protection and the perks that being in these guilds would allow. It meant they could suffer persecution from others and often did. Their Christian principles, though, had to come first. And the church in Thyatira seems to be being split by false teaching. And it's probably, it seems to focus on this area of compromise. Now, if you go back to the Old Testament, you can read a lot about somebody called Jezebel. And here, John is making, or Jesus is making a link with the Old Testament and the New Testament and what Jezebel was like in the book uh, when she was having dealings with Elijah. It seems they were possibly compromising on Christian teaching when it came to sexual ethics and behaviour. And they were certainly compromising, some of them, on taking part of things that specifically went against the teaching of the early church about food sacrificed to idols and worshipping other idols. So that's the situation in Thyatira. But how does that apply to us in today's world? I wonder, are we sometimes tempted to compromise our Christian principles? Are there bits of the Bible that we choose to ignore? Because actually we don't really like those bits. Are there things that we do or things that we say only because it's an easier path to take than to stand up for our Christian principles? Or perhaps because it allows us to make a bit of money or to hold on to our money a bit more? Because the lesson for the people in Thyatira is as true for them as it is for us. And I think there is something here we can learn from this. There's something here about us avoiding places and practices we know that are unhealthy for us spiritually. Now, if a, if a pub is a place you tend to fall into unhealthy situations, then stop going to the pub. If you're a member of a WhatsApp group that always seems to be indulging in gossip, leave the group. If you find yourself watching or looking at inappropriate images on the internet late at night, Stop going on the internet late at night. If when you go shopping, you're compromising ethical standards and environment and trade standards because actually the air products are a little bit more expensive and, and you can save a bit of money for yourself. Well, do you get the idea? This is about compromise. Sometimes compromise is not right. And to summarize this message in Thyatira, good stuff is happening, but don't be led astray. Let the Holy Spirit lead you. We're told that the one who searches hearts and minds, that means he knows the truth in our hearts. So don't compromise your Christian principles. It will be hard though. It will be hard. But the good news is this. Those who come through and stay faithful will be rewarded. And actually, there is more good news. Because if you have been involved in those things in the past and bad things, you can always repent and you can be forgiven just like that boy on the train I talked about earlier on in the service. Now there's much more that could be said about Thyatira but I think we should move on to Sardis because Sardis is a little bit more uh, complicated perhaps. Sardis was a city with an illustrious past, not like Thyatira. It was a former capital city. It was still perceived by, as a city of importance by some 
It was the first center to make gold and silver coins. It held the royal mint in effect. It was famous for its arts and crafts. Some of you might have heard of the expression, as rich as Croatius. Well, Croatius was the king of Sardis when it was at its wealthiest point in time. You know, Sardis was a, a commercially prosperous and it was a militarily important city throughout its history. Uh, the reason it was mil militarily important uh, and strategically important was due to the fact that it was built on a, on a mountain. It was viewed as unconquerable due to its high and nearly vertical walls of rock. And yet the funny thing is, twice Sardis had been conquered through lack of vigilance. And on both occasions, the Sardisians hadn't set a guard on the walls. They were so confident in their city's location that they thought that would protect them. But it didn't. The first occasion when it was one of the most important cities in the world, 700 years before this letter was written. It was at the peak of its wealth. Croatius was the king, but Sardis was conquered in a surprise attack by Cyrus the Persian. That's the same leader that we read about in the Old Testament, in Daniel and in Isaiah, for example. Now, to be caught napping once is unfortunate. To be caught napping twice, that's just careless. But 200 years after that, Exactly the same thing happened again. And it was captured this time by the Greeks. And again, nobody was keeping watch on the walls. And then it comes to the first century AD, to the time of Jesus or thereabouts. And a massive earthquake hits the city of Sardis. The life of the city drained out. And in a bid to recapture its former glory, it begged the Romans to allow them to build a temple of, a temple of worship to the emperor. But they weren't allowed. That honour had been given to Smyrna. Come to Smyrna another time. So Sardis was a town or a city that was living on its past glory and its past memories. And as I wrote those words, I found myself thinking, ouch. One of the biggest moans I hear about Warsaw is people harking back to the past. It's not like it used to be. The market isn't what it once was. You know, once people came from all over the West Midlands to go shopping at our market. Sardis was a town or a city living on its past glory and its memories. And sadly, the same also seems to be true of the church at Sardis. And if Sardis equates to Walsall, what does a church at Sardis equate to? It's a bit uncomfortable when you think about it like that, isn't it? Sardis was alive, but only just. And at the time of this letter, Sardis was a city of peace. But this was a piece of lethargy and past dreams. The city is dying. And the basic prognosis in this letter is that the church is also dying. In every previous letter so far in Revelation... Jesus has generally started with an encouragement. That's not the case with Sardis. They are labouring under the misapprehension uh, that they're actually doing okay. And they need to be aware that they are uh, labouring under a misapprehension. Pretty sharpish. They're in effect a church that's living on apathy. And the thing about apathy is you don't have to work very hard at it to become very good at it. That's the thing about apathy. You know, somebody once, knew, somebody once asked me if I knew the difference between ignorance and apathy. I said, I don't know and I don't care. Now, the funny thing is, in all of this, as we read in this letter, Sardis is known as a church for being alive. In the modern world, it might seem like the kind of church that regularly features in the local press or, or even the national press. Oh, yeah, that's happened to Warsaw, to us, twice in the last month. As people drive past the church on Sunday morning, its car park is full to overflowing. Overflowing, They're having to park on double yellow lines in Sardis. Oh, the place always seems busy. The buildings always seem to be used. To others, the church seems alive. But Jesus sees the deeper and the truer picture. And he knows the church is dying there. So how does a church die? Here are two possible ways. 
Firstly, for a church to die, it, fall, it fails to be distinctive from its surrounding culture. It adopts the lifestyles and the, the practices of the culture. It no longer represents a different way of being. There's something here about compromise again. Think of Thyatira. It's a bit like that. I don't know if you noticed when we read this passage or when we heard the passage being read by uh, Sarah, there is no mention of any persecution in Sardis. That's unlike all of the other churches pretty much mentioned in Revelation. It seems, it seems like neither the Jews nor the Romans actually give two figs about the church in Sardis. Why not? Well, it's surrounded by all these other churches that are suffering persecution. This one obviously isn't worth bothering about. It's almost as if the church at Sardis has become meaningless. It's so similar to the culture it's in. The church has become irrelevant. And that is one of the most damning things you can ever say about a church or about an individual. And it was this failure to witness to its faith in front of the unbelieving culture that was a problem for Sardis. I wonder if that is true potentially of the church today. You know, I'm a big fan of using modern culture to help us get our Christian message across. But I'm also aware that churches that don't challenge their culture end up being shaped by it. And that can be very, very unhealthy. So compromise can cause a church to die. But there's also a second and opposite danger that can cause a church to die as well. Uh, it becomes so far removed from the surrounding culture as to be unable to engage with it. And it seems to become irrelevant because of that. It's really hard, this is. And we need to ask ourselves here, how do we do at St. Matthew's like this? Are we engaged with culture, both as a parish church, but also with as individuals? And I mean with people outside of the church. Or is our life spent in church activities, with church members, in a holy huddle. As individual Christians and as Christian churches, we need to be balanced. We need to be part of society and our culture, but not so absorbed by it that we can't be seen to be distinctively different. It's a really difficult balance. And although we have things in common with our culture, and it's right that we should, sometimes we also need to be prepared to stand up or stand out in a crowd to be different. Now, I mentioned earlier, lack of vigilance seems to have been an issue with, or an unfortunate habit in Sardis. Losing their city once due to lack of vigilance might be unfortunate, twice just carelessness. But sadly, the church in Sardis seems to have caught that cultural habit of complacency. I'm going to say something now that possibly could get me fired as an archdeacon. Personally, I think the church in this country has been too complacent in the past, particularly up to the time of COVID. Perhaps then we've changed a bit. And I would say actually now I think there is a danger that the Church of England is swinging too far the other way, assimilating too much the values and the standards of the wider society without questioning them. You know, we mustn't lose what makes us a distinctively Christian church. If the church in this country is to survive, we cannot be complacent or apathetic. We cannot live on past glories. That's true for every church, and it's also true for individuals. So what is the remedy? Well, firstly, it's the same remedy for Sardis as it is for us. The first thing the treatment says is, wake up! Wake up! You know, the situation in Sardis is dire, but it's not totally hopeless. Immediate action is required. Wake up! Perhaps in some respects this is a metaphor for the church in our country at the moment. And COVID pandemic was a wake-up call for us. A wake-up to radical action, not a gentle, are you awake yet? This is, wake up! And often there is a tendency to allow Christian, uh, complacency to drift into our spiritual lives. We might need to wake up that little spark that we had. We need to fan it into a flame before it dies. The Sardisians are accused of not completing the work they've started. 
Obviously, that's something that could be true of any church. But it's also true at an individual level. When a person is not doing what they could and should be doing as followers of Jesus. And it's not the fact that the church in Sardis doesn't know what to do. It's not like they aren't even doing some of this stuff. It's like they're doing God's work, but they're doing it half-heartedly. It's not so much the quantity, it's the quality of the work that is a problem. They're letting things drift. And allowing things to drift can be a very dangerous way to carry on. I've known many churches that just seem to drift aimlessly along. And sadly, as the acting archdeacon, I am now having to go around and talk with churches about closing. But it's also true for individuals. Christians can drift as well. I've noticed something in the last 20 years of my ministry. I think you may have noticed it as well. I wonder how many people do you know who, at this church or in other churches who have just seemed to drift away? People who were once so committed to their faith have now drifted away. So how can we help ourselves and others when we're aware, perhaps, that we're starting to drift? Because very few people deliberately say, right, that's it, I'm not going anymore. They just drift away. Well, the Sardisians are told, remember what you have seen, uh, remember what you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent. Or as another translation puts it, I like this translation. Think of the gift you once had in your hands, the message you heard with your ears. Grasp it again and turn back to God. What does it mean to remember, hold fast and repent? Well, I think it's something about remembering the call to follow Jesus, that first call. That's not a call to inaction, that's a call to action, to keep following. It requires obedience. It's not a one-off call, it's a continuous call. Now, of course, all of us are humans. We all make mistakes. That's why we say a confession every week. We constantly fail to follow that call in our lives, to follow Jesus in everything we do. So we constantly need to repent, hold fast, and return, and reorient ourselves. And the good thing is that forgiveness is always possible because God loves you. So as I come towards the end of my talk today, which has been a bit of a ramble, I am aware of that, but at least it wasn't an hour long. What can we learn from these letters to Thyatira and Sardis? Well, here are three things that I've mentioned today that, and to help you remember them, they all begin with the letter C, okay, because I'm nice like that. Firstly, we need to make sure we don't compromise. And that will mean that we need to remove ourselves from situations sometimes. Sometimes it may lead to being rejected by parts of society. Not to be so absorbed in it, we need to be part of it. We need to be distinctively different. It's a hard balance, as I said. But for me, the way I know about that balance is by reading the Bible. If you don't know how to balance your Christian life, read the Bible. Secondly, don't be complacent as individuals or as a church. You know, we mustn't be complacent with our faith and just left it drift, let it drift. We need to examine ourselves spiritually to see if we need to wake up and to repent and to reorient. We need to ask ourselves, are we spiritually complacent? And if so, how are, how are we? How are you going to address that problem and return to the right path? And thirdly, although the situation may sound pretty bad, it's not hopeless and we can have confidence we can see that for both those in Thyatira and those in Sardis who come through, who stay faithful, they get rewarded at the final judgment. What do we have to do? Confess the name of Jesus, not just in what we say, but also in what we do. And then he will return the favour when it really matters, when we are called to account on judgment day. It's like a two-way friendship with Jesus. If we acknowledge him, he will acknowledge us. This is a message to wake up. And yet there's also the message of great hope. Jesus still wants to acknowledge us, like he wanted the church in Sardis and Thyatira. He wants us to acknowledge, wants to acknowledge us and to tell his Father that we belong to him. Jesus wants us to have eternal life. We've got ears, as it says in that passage. Let us hear. Let us listen. 
Your future is up to you. You've heard the prognosis, you know the treatment. Your future is up to you. So I'm going to pause now for 30 seconds and we're going to think. Every one of us can think of this question. What lessons have I learned today from Thyatira and Sardis that I need to apply in my life this coming week? 30 seconds to think and then Alison is going to come back up and lead us.